So my name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer. Um, what I'd like to do first is, is read the word together. And so uh, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. If you're on the live stream, same thing. Um, and what we're going to do, if you're able to, is we're going to stand together as we read the word together. So if you would please stand with me. Um, if you're on the live stream, you can stand um, as well if you'd like. It'll be on the screen too, so. 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who's truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them, and let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. This is the word of the Lord. You could be seated. Thank you. So um, as, as we look, we'll, we'll be staying here today in chapter 5, and we'll do, do some, some exploring elsewhere in Scripture. But um, what Paul is doing here in chapter 5, especially in verses 1 and 2, is he's, he's basically just continuing his letter. He's continuing his conversation of checking in on Timothy and checking on the health of the church. And it kind of goes in step with, um, if you back up, if you, and I would say keep your Bible open today, we're going we're gonna to kind of keep going to it. But in verse 12 of chapter 4, so if you kind of look back a little bit, he says to Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love, faith and purity. Uh, he says, um, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. He, so essentially, he's just continuing that conversation that, that we talked about last week. He's encouraging him um, as he inter interacts with people within the church. And so he says, especially here in verses 1 and 2, because verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5, you'll notice, they just look different than the rest of what we're reading today. Verses 1 and 2 says, this is how to encourage one another in the church. He says, especially when you're dealing with talking to or ministering to older saints, first of all, give respect due to their age. So number one, like give them respect due to their age and also give them affection due to parents. So give them respect for their age and, 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 and show them affection as you would a parent. And this is, this is important and he wants to start here because this is in step with us being a family of God, us being a church family, us, us being this, this household of God, a buttress of truth. Because a church family, this family of God is one body, Paul says elsewhere. We're one body with many members, and Christ is the head of that body. But in many ways, right, Paul's writing to Timothy because there were issues in the church. There were things going on that were distortions of the gospel, distortions of sound doctrine, distortions and, and bringing into it false teaching. So in a, in a lot of practical ways, the head had been chopped off the body of, of, of the church and the body was just kind of running rampant 
and not interacting in the way that it should, not being this, this safe place of refuge, the household of God, this buttress of truth. It wasn't holding up its end of the bargain. A lot of that stuff we, we talked about last week, but Paul's telling Timothy, hey man, you, you need to be able to adjust your relationships. You need to be able to walk into these, these scenarios and have a little bit of, of self-awareness. Timothy, you need to be able to read the room. In a lot of ways, Paul's saying there's going to be some, some hard conversations, and this resonates. So even last week when we talked about, hey, let no one despise you for your youth, set, up, set believers an example in speech, he's saying operate in the gifting that, that, that the church has blessed you and that God has given you. Operate in that gift because you're going to be dealing with a lot of different kind of people. And this resonates because I said last week, I'm 35. I'm, I'm in my, my mid-30s now, and that's what Timothy was in. He's early to mid-30s. And he's saying, hey, Timothy, it's essential to be, as a pastor, you've got to be self-aware. You've got to be able to, to go into a room and read the situation. You've got to be able to discern. You've got to be relational. He's calling him to dynamic leadership in verses 1 and 2. Because we know this, Redeemer Church knows this, we are not one massive, giant affinity group. We look different. We sound different from different races and backgrounds and ethnicities and income levels and educations and neighborhoods from different parts of the country. He says, be dynamic because you're going to be serving a dynamic church. Be attentive to the needs of the flock. You got to be able to address them appropriately. And I think he's, he's priming him. A lot of this is tough because, you know, Paul's basically saying, Hey, Timothy, you got to have lots of hard conversations, man. (laughs) That's, that's what's coming up for you. And, and he's, not, he's not lying. Like, I, I can say with, with clarity, like, I get that. Like, as your pastor, as your friend, most of my job is just having, having hard conversations. Not most of it. A lot of my job is having hard conversations that are, that are not just hard, but they're also beautiful, and they're also good, and they're also worthy. They're also necessary. But as just as many hard conversations that I, that I get to have as a pastor here, I get to have a lot of great, awesome light conversations and and celebratory conversations. And I get to look across the table at people and say, man, it is so obvious that God is working and moving in your life right now. It is so obvious the impact that you're having on your regroup and in those around you and on Sunday mornings and to to your neighbors. So yes, Paul's like, hey, Tim, there's some stuff going on in the church that we got to talk about. But I also get the benefit of saying like, but man, there are some good things to celebrate in the church. Be a, he says, be a dynamic leader. I guess that's all in verses one and two. Well, anyways. But as we get going today, the introduction is going to be a, bit, a little bit longer because I think it's necessary for us to kind of sit in some parts of Scripture that are going to help, help set the tone for where, where we're going to be at in First Timothy. Because the Bible has a lot to say about widows. It has a lot to say about orphans. It has a lot to say about the sojourner, those without a home. John Stott, uh, he's a, he was a pastor back in the mid to late 1900s. Um, we've been, Andy and I have been reading through his commentary to help us kind of prepare for this sermon series. Um, on a side note, he wrote a book called The Cross of Christ. I know many of you uh, have read through that. I would highly encourage that as we approach Easter, as we walk through this season of Lent, um, talking about the implications of the cross. Uh, John Stott's The Cross of Christ is a fantastic read. But I digress He says this, he says, when talking about widows, when talking about orphans, when talking about the sojourner, the the refugee, he says, they are valued for who they are in themselves. They are said said to deserve special honor, protection, and care. They're valued for who they are. So get ready. You know, Rachel mentioned in the announcements, sometimes you just got to drink from the fire hydrant of scripture. Secret church is that. Secret Church is David Platt, an incredible teacher, literally just melting your face for six hours of Bible teaching. It's crazy. We're going for about half that today, time-wise. But here we go. Psalm 68, 5. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Deuteronomy 10, 18. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Psalm 146, 9. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. 
Exodus 22, 22, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Deuteronomy 27, 19, cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow, and all the people shall say, amen. Isaiah 1, 17, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Zechariah 7.10, do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. And then lastly, Malachi 3.5, then I, God, then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages the widow and the fatherless against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. There's a lot more in the Old Testament about what God says about the widow and the orphan and the sojourner, what he says about vulnerable people. God has a lot to say about that. But, but not just God. Jesus has plenty to say about that. In the Gospels, Jesus cared for the widow of Nain, in Luke chapter seven, by bringing her only son back to life, telling her, do not weep as he had compassion on her. He commended the widow's offering in Mark chapter 12 by saying to his disciples, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. He cautioned his disciples about the scribes and Pharisees who were taking advantage of widows in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And finally, Jesus from the very cross where he was nailed, he entrusted the care of his widowed mother to John. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So there's, there's plenty to be said. Old Testament, the Gospels, there's plenty to be said in the book of Acts of how we care for the vulnerable in community. There's plenty other pastoral epistles. James, there's so much to be said about widow care. And Paul, Paul knew this. Paul was well-studied and well-read and knew doctrine, and he understood the heart of God. He understood who Jesus was. He said, care for the widow is close to the heart of God. It's close to the heart of Christ. So that's, that's where we're coming from today. It wasn't just some kind of like, oh, hey, Timothy, by the way, kind of manage the widows over there. Just this random group, go, go, go kind of take care of them. No, it's come from a deep place of understanding, like this is close to God's heart, this is close to Jesus' heart. The church, God's people, need to be about caring for the vulnerable. So that being said, ultimately, we're gonna be in two sections of scripture right here, kind of. Verses three through eight, if you want to look at it that way, some of your Bibles might have them broken up into paragraphs that way. Verses three through eight, and then verses nine through 16. So this first grouping, and we'll kind of walk through this again, this first grouping are essentially those that are in need of financial support, of financial assistant, assistance. That word honor widows translates to financial support in the church. So that's that kind of first grouping, and we'll walk through that. In the second grouping, you'll see that word enroll, to, to be registered, to step into how they might serve and benefit the local church in a ministerial capacity or a serving capacity. And I think as we look through this, it's not as black and white at times as we would like it to be. There's a lot of overlap in how these things play out in the church, especially here at Ephesus. At Ephesus. But those two groups, can I keep those in mind? So if we look at verses three through eight, ha have this question in mind. Who, okay, so who qualifies for church support? How do we determine that? What does that look like? So let's read. Verse three, 
honor widows who are truly widows. You'll see that, that word, truly widows, those two words, truly widows, a few times. You'll see it there in verse 3. Uh, you'll see it in, in verse 5. Uh, she who's truly a widow, you'll see it again in verse 16. So we may care for those who are truly widows. What he's saying is those that are financially qualified through destitution, through, through having lost their husband. Because in the Greco-Roman world, this was a massively significant life-altering problem. Because your husband was the one that brought wealth to the family. If you do not have that, if you do not have family, you're basically left out, you're destitute. You have no support. So Paul's making this big cry right here that, hey, this, this is obvious that this is someone that needs care. Because right after that, in verse 4, we see a little bit of a shift of, okay, what's next? But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. So this first group is, okay, are they financially qualified through being destitute, from being left behind with, they don't have, they don't have anything. Church obviously needs to step into that. And also, well, qualified through godliness. Jump to um, uh, verse five. She who's truly a widow left all alone has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So financially qualified through destitution and spiritually qualified through godliness. But let's hop back up to verse four. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household to make some return to their parents. This is, this is an opportunity right here, Paul's telling Timothy, where you can, you can partner with local families at the local church. There is a responsibility on the family, on the local family, to care for widows, to care for the vulnerable and their family. And ultimately, you, you, you probably have, you, you read this, and there might be a couple connotations that you have. You, you might have an extremely positive view of that because you've seen it play out in your family or you've seen it play out of friends with, that have had this happen in their families. You know, I, I've seen it up close, both through my family and through Taryn's family, that when a grandparent passed away, my family stepped in and cared. When that happened with Taryn's family and her granddad, I saw her family step in and care for a loved one. And I have, I have extremely positive views of that, right? Because I've seen that on a very close up level. I've seen my dad, I've seen my mom care for loved ones. I've seen Taryn's family care for loved ones. And this is really interesting because why does that, why does that matter? Why does Paul say, hey, this is important? For this is pleasing in the sight of God. That is why. Everything we read at the beginning in the Old Testament and in the Gospels, and look at Jesus, how he approaches widow care, this is pleasing in the sight of God. This is a positive thing. This should be a good thing when families step in and care for loved ones. But maybe you don't have a good view of that or a healthy view of that, or you have a negative view of that because you've seen it break down. And you've seen people fight over estates and you've seen greed and you've seen people not take on responsibility in that way. But Paul says this is pleasing to God. Caring for the widow, caring for the vulnerable is one of the marks of a healthy church. And Paul is doing his best, I feel like, to say to Timothy, you, you need to be talking to the families in the community. You, you, you need to get them to partner with the church in this. The negative expression, and we've seen the positive expression. Why, why is this important? Because it matters to God. It's close to the heart of God. This is pleasing in the sight of God. But the negative expression, jump down to verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, He's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So Christian sons and daughters are responsible to help provide care to widows. Even in light, even in light of things like Social Security, 
right? Investments, retirement, assisted living centers, nurses helping, et cetera. Like there's still a call on your life as a Christian son and daughter in this relationship to care for the vulnerable. And I, and I, and I think at times this, we kind of make this overly complicated, but Paul's just trying to say like, family should, the family should care for the loved one. Like it just should. It's pleasing in the sight of God. And I think that it's helpful to also say, maybe you're like, I don't have the finances to, to do that. Great. Paul's saying partner with the church. This is all for Paul, a partnership. He talks about family a lot. He refers to the church as a family a lot because he wants it to operate in a, care, a caring way as we care for the vulnerable. Partnering with families here. And in some ways, you know, he says, um, no, verse 7, command these things as well. He says, keep teaching these things. Keep talking about these things. Be in community while you're, while you're talking about how to do this well. Don't stop talking about how to care for widows. Command these things. Teach these things. Okay, so that, that's, that's the first grouping. This, this thing of like, hey, they've been left destitute. They, these are true widows. They, they need help. The church needs to step in here. And in some cases... The family can take care of that and deal with that, and the church can come alongside and support, or the family doesn't have the means to do that, and the church still comes alongside and supports. Because as we'll continue to kind of look at today, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy in a lot of ways because he's heard reports of there's a breakdown in the, systemat the, the systematized way of how things are happening, how people are getting help. And, and, and he's, he's addressing this, this group of widows, however many it was, at, at the church at Ephesus because there was a breakdown in how things were playing out and those that needed help the most were being left in the dust and were not being cared for and the ones that were receiving help could be helped in other ways. So this first group is those that needed that financial assistance from the church. The second group, we'll say 9 through 16, is that word that I said earlier, that, let the widow be enrolled. Those that need to be registered, need to be enrolled, and need to be set up in a serving capacity to some degree. Starting in verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works, if she's brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the feet of saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. This is a registry. This is a sitting across the table and trying to do an intake form almost of, hey, how can we best serve you? How can we best help you? What kind of parameters can we set up around you in a, disciple, in a discipleship fashion to help you through this? Are you capable of, of, of offering service to the church and stepping into some type of spiritual ministry? So this last section, this second grouping, there's, there's three things that I want us to hold on to. One of them is the continuity in community. And we'll talk about this, continuity in community. Number two, um, that membership matters. Um, church membership matters. And then number three, uh, the coordination of care in the local church is of vital importance. So there's gonna be, there's gotta need to be continuity of community membership matters on a local level, level in a church, and the coordination of care is vital. So he's trying to set up a parameter here. Let, let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works. Is character matching up to what's going on here in her financial situation? And ultimately, I hope you would agree, the, the best way to care for people is not through chaos and, and not through complete you know, no structure, that, that doesn't seem helpful. You make a plan, you make provisions based on someone's needs that's sitting across from you, and you assess those needs. That's, that's stewardship. That's part of the process. You've got to set up some type of measurement, some type of guide. You know, I've had, um, over the last year, many conversations with many different people um, about the CDC. <laughs> and... Pastor Jacob, who's one of the pastors here at Redeemer, he's a, he's a doctor. Uh, his wife Jenny's also a doctor. And anytime we've had to walk through, I mean, same thing with Andy, right? What does quarantine look like? How do we, 
every time someone gets COVID or someone is exposed to COVID, you all know this through and through. You've got to walk through that whole process of, okay, who, did, who was I around? You know, was I within six feet for longer than 12 minutes? Were they wearing a mask? Would they have any symptoms? Was it within that 48, was it within that 48 hour period? You know, and we're always asking those questions, even though we've done it so many times, it's like, well, okay, was that the right thing? And Jacob over and over and over again, would just say, hey, at some point, the CDC would have to draw a guideline, draw a line in the sand and say, we think this is the best way. And that's where we're gonna kind of operate within that because you don't wanna just lead through, through chaos and just make some kind of blanket statement. Because in a lot of ways, the, the system, if you wanna call it that, the church, was getting a little bit log jammed with people taking up too much space of, they didn't necessarily need the exact same amount of money that this, this widow that just lost her husband that just has no support at all from the family and has no hope of ever marrying someone again to help with support. The people that weren't in that situation were kind of clogging the system up. So Paul's just trying to be practical. He's trying to say, Timothy, maybe this will help. And I'm like, Paul, you're asking Timothy to go have all these awkward conversations with all these women in the church that have like been widowed? <laughs> like that sounds really hard, right? Thanks a lot, Paul, you know? <laughs> when are you gonna show up, you know? But I, I feel that, that that's hard. He's trying to say, hey, as you care for people, discipleship matters. This is important to walk through this in community with people. There will be hard conversations, but you have to be able to assess the needs of those that are in front of you. If you keep reading, they refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. Again, he, he's trying to assess the needs in the best way possible at the cultural moment for the church at Ephesus of how to best care for widows in the church. Who, who, who are the, the, the true widows? How do we honor them well? financially? How do we support them spiritually? And if there are some in the church that it's better for them to step into ministry contexts, to step in acts of service, to serve in the church, and they have the capability and capacity to do that, that could be extremely helpful for them instead of just a blanket, you know, just giving out of, of church resources and finances just across the board. You, it's helpful in this scenario to come in underneath that with a level of discipleship. And this is, you know, we have this, this idea right here that membership matters, in my opinion. Because how else do you know what's going on in people's lives? For us at Redeemer, the, the membership covenant is this thing that, no, it's, I've had two membership meetings this past week. And in each one, not, not in this week, but I had one a couple weeks ago. But in those meetings, I always say, Redeemer's membership covenant was not just like, this one page of scripture that we took out and we're like, oh great, we went to this membership chapter and now we're good to go. There's no chapter and verse that says, hey, this is what exactly church membership looks like at Redeemer Church, but we say this is how we find it most helpful to walk together in a faith community as we hold each other accountable, as we follow Jesus together as best we can in a local church setting. And so we, we find that church membership really matters. And I've, I had a conversation with someone this past week that was like, man, the way that Redeemer does membership, I've never really experienced that. Churches that I've been a part of don't really address membership other than, hey, this person joined today, say hi, and then it's just kind of, you never talk about membership again with that person. That's just not who we are. That's not how Redeemer Church, Redeemer Church operates. We, we take it seriously. We, we care about one another through the membership covenant. It holds us accountable together. And we look at it every year. We walk through it in our regroups and we say, this is important. Are, are we sure we want to do this thing again with these crazy people in this broken world? Are we sure we want to do this again? And we, we walk through it. So as Paul is addressing these needs, it's important to have some type of parameter, some type of thing to help control this. Uh, one example that comes to mind, I'll bring up COVID again, but... This past summer, July, August, the pastor sat down, and many of you have heard this story. We, we sat down and we were like, man, God has blessed us financially through a pandemic 
That's just God's grace. How in the world did that happen? How did we get more financially healthy in a pandemic? That just seems, that seems weird. And so we came to a point where we're like, well, like we need to just give some money away. We don't know exactly how much that is. What do you think? And we bounced it off of each other. And we came to a decision where we're like $30,000. That wasn't some chapter and verse in the Bible. We just prayed about it and said, hey, let's just do that. Let's give away $30,000. Now, it wouldn't have been helpful to just set up 30 grand in cash and just kind of set it outside Redeemer, that probably would have been a little bit chaotic, right? Or in briefcases or something weird like that. <laughs> why, why does my mind always go to like crime situations, you know what I mean, or movies? So our best plan was Josh Caudill, who's on our staff team, is amazing, and he has an organized brain, and he could bring order to the chaos. And so we tasked Josh with that because he's awesome. And he is one of many, he's one of many ministers of spreadsheets at Redeemer that is so good at that. And he spreadsheeted the heck out of that. It was amazing. And what we did is we just put it out there to the, to the community and said, if you have a need, we want to help you. Not everybody asked for the same amount. Not every asked for the same need. There were tons of different scenarios. But you could ask Josh, I think the money was, was spent in like three or four days. Because, and none of those people were from Redeemer. That was just a need that was met. God bless Josh's organized mind, right? But that's a, that's a beautiful picture of organization coming in the midst of chaos because chaos wouldn't have necessarily helped in that situation. Membership matters. Gospel coaching matters. That's the way that we do one-on-one -on -one discipleship here at Redeemer. Having gospel-centric conversations over and over and over again so that it permeates every bit of your mind, heart, and soul. How did, asking the question across from someone, hey, what was, your, what was your week like? How did the gospel speak into that? So that's a, if, you're, if you're listening on the live stream, if you're here today and you've never been to Redeemer Church, I'm talking about a lot of different things. Church membership is, is vitally important. We love that. Come talk to me about that. Gospel coaching is vitally important. And then regroups. So I have the, the, the honor and the privilege to oversee the health, the vitality, the growth, the multiplication, and the care of our regroups. Those are how we gather together in small groups in homes across Norman and across this area on a biweekly basis. They, they, don't, they don't meet here at the church. They meet in people's homes and on Zoom because COVID, which we're hoping to maybe get out of that eventually, right? But, but this matters. And so when you read through this stuff, these, these parameters that Paul's putting on this, Paul's saying that full well knowing that he's got, the, he's got the household of God to uphold this, right? He's got the, the community of believers to step into this with Timothy. He's not just giving this blanket statement to Timothy saying, hey, good luck, man. I hope, you, hope, you, hope you're all right riding solo on this. That was not the case. Paul knew that the church was there for a reason to have these hard conversations and to walk and actually be a part of people's lives so that you actually know the real, literal needs of those in the community of faith. So not only does membership matter, but the coordination of care is, is so significant. Stott says, the church's sense of social responsibility is not to encourage irresponsibility in others. Just read that as stewardship. Like Stewardship is, is, is so important. It doesn't mean that sometimes someone walks in off the street into our building on a weekday like that happened this week, and he was like, I need help with, with paying for my laundry. And I was like, let's go. And we go take care of his laundry, give him a ride, get him to a place where he's staying. There wasn't a lot of organization in that. That was just, you do that, right? A need presents itself. But in some cases, like what's going on in the church here, there needed, there needed a little bit more conversation, a little bit more intake form. Hey, how can we best walk through this together in, in, in a way that we're actually experiencing discipleship? Because it would have been in some ways easier, right, for the church to just kind of just hand out checks to everybody and just kind of say, hey, you know, good luck with that. But there's also spiritual needs there. And by doing that, it actually wasn't easier for the church because they weren't fulfilling their duty. And, and, and there were actual, what, what, what Paul calls true widows that were left destitute financially and spiritually that weren't getting help. The, there's got to be some kind of like medium in there, right, where we kind of approach this from a discipleship aspect. How do we do this as a church?
So the advice and encouragement given to Timothy was, was so awesome because it allowed for the number of widows receiving support to be reduced to those who, who really needed it, who actually needed that, both financially and spiritually. And then families within the household of God were admonished to help love and care for widows entrusted to them alongside partnership in the church. And, and why was that so, so important? Because it's, it should shock us in verse 8 of chapter 5. If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Like, that, sh- that, that was kind of Paul doing that loaded language like, hey, wake up. <laughs> this, this is happening in the church. That should shock you and wake you up. So continuity in community. Because he says, hey, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever because Roman culture, they even took care of their people that way. He's like, you're, you're, you're worse than that. The church in Ephesus had this amazing opportunity and privilege to be a beacon of light to their city through caring for those in need. Like literally caring for the vulnerable was an opportunity for them to, to preach the gospel. So, to, so being organized and not living in a state of chaos as they cared for widows and had hard conversations and tried to step into discipleship and live in community, to, to do the Acts 2, 42 through 47, gathering in homes, sharing resources, sharing meals together, over that process, and if ask anybody that's a part of a regroup, like you will learn people's needs very quickly once you start spending time with them. Paul was counting on that. Paul was banking on that. So within the household of God, there was needed this, this continuity in community. Membership matters, and the coordination of care was extremely important. How we, how we love and care for people matters. We, we are the household of God. Craig preached on this a few weeks ago. At the end of chapter 3, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Fast forward to 4, verse 8. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This is just in the flow of Paul talking about the importance of the local church, that it's a buttress for truth. The church isn't the truth. God is the truth. The word of God is the truth. But the, but the church gets to live that out and, and reflect that to, a, to an unbelieving world in how we care for the vulnerable. He says, we're the household of God. We serve a living God. We're the buttress of truth. Our whole existence is, is to shine the light of the gospel as bright as possible, right here, right now. And it can be done through things like caring for the vulnerable, caring for the widow, walking in community with them, giving them resources. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to open our word together, Father. Thank you for these types of passages that help us literally just think through different scenarios of what our week might look like, the people that we might come across, Father, the hurting and broken around us. Thank you that we don't have to do this alone, Father, but thank you for things like community. Thank you for systems like gospel coaching and regroups as we try to minister to those around us, as we try to live a life on mission that's directed at the broken because that's what your son did. Father, help us to do this well. Help us to love those around us. Help us to walk in community. Um, Help us to walk in vulnerability, Father, so that we might serve those better that are vulnerable. We ask these things in your name. Amen.